Right, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, my life in music. It gives me great pleasure to have the wonderful Nigel Price with me. How you doing, Nigel? Yes, it's good to be here. I'm not bad. You all right? Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so we'll just crack straight on. Um, family history. Oh. Um, are you a local person? I know you kind of live in Surrey now. Is it Epsom? Uh, yeah. Well, I was actually born in Molesey. Oh, okay. So you're really quite local to yes. here. Yes. We're in Sunbury, so right. Yeah. Yes, um, I d uh, West Molesey, not East Molesey. You know the poor part. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I was born on the sofa. Not the Hampton Court side, then. No, 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 no. Yeah. More the sort of reservoir side. Right. It's, um, uh, yeah. You were born on the sofa. I was born on the sofa. Yeah. Oh wow. I feel a kind of affinity. Big fa large sofas. family. Um, well, it got bigger after that. You were you were the first born. I was the yeah. second. Right. I had to think about that. So, Just keep getting bigger sofas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was the only one that was born on the sofa. Right. But, um, yes, no, I'm uh, elder brother, um, younger sister, and then a much younger brother. So, um, oh, I'm just going to press record on here, just in case we've got everything. Uh, just to say that the um, we've all prayed to the internet gods tonight, so hopefully <laughs> it's a good connection. Um, I'm recording everything again on the, on the desk, so um, everything's kept. In case it goes completely down, we've got everything for posterity. Um, if anyone's got any questions or anything, if you want to just put it in the live chat, I can ask Nigel um, uh, anything you you know you might be interested in, or you want to expand on anything we're talking about. Um, so yeah, what are your earliest musical memories? How what's the, what how, what what did you how did you get into music and and what's the first things you listened to and, and that you liked? Was it things your parents played? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my dad had quite a good record collection. Well, he had a record collection, um, which, I, yeah, that, that was that was all I had really. And I, I used to love the record player, and we had a radiogram. You know, I used to love sort of lifting that thing up and putting on the records. Uh, he had everything by the Beatles, so you could pretty pretty much safely say that I was brought up on the Beatles. Brilliant. And, that sort of era, the, the Hollies and all that sort of thing. Um, he had a lot of Drifters records as well. Um, and of course, uh, there was some later stuff in there, like Queen. Oh, um, great. Uh, News of the World. I mean, I, I absolutely right. loved that album. Yeah. I used to sort of, you know, sort of open up these like double vinyl things, look at the great big sleeve and love that, love the artwork and all that sort of thing. Brilliant. I just thought it was, it was, Did, just was a, your dad a musician at all? He wasn't, no. No, he was just a, a big music fan. Um, yeah. Uh, so it was a real mixed bag I and mean, there was a bit of country music in there as well. And, uh, there was a Sidney Bechet record, but I, I didn't really get it. No. Um, <laughs> there was there was Ackerbilk as well. I remember Stranger on the Shore. Um, you know. It's uh, so quite an eclectic coll yeah, collection. I guess Great. so, yeah. yeah. I, I was much more into the the sort of pop side of it. Right. I didn't, didn't really get the jazz thing. No. At all. No. You know. So when did you start playing the guitar? 11, age 11. And that's your first instrument? It was, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just a bunch of us got together at school. And uh, it was it was just a thing to do. It, it's just... I, I can't even remember who had the idea now, but right. I just thought, what a great idea. So it was your friends, they all kind of said, yeah. let's form a, form a band or just play some music or something. Exactly, exactly. We just thought it would be a great thing to do. And of course, it was in the era where, um, well, like Top of the Pops, it was everything, you know. Yeah. Was, we had that Top of the Pops every week, and yeah. you come into the playground the next day, and it's like, oh, wow, did you see that? You know, oh, I was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. There's a scramble yeah. to learn the lyrics, or, yeah. you know, like Kate Bush, Wuthering Heights. God, did you see that? And Brilliant. And so, were you taught self-taught? Did you just yeah, completely get a book out the the um, library or something, or just buy? Yeah, I, did, I had various things. Um, uh, it, um, I, I, I actually had to save up um, save up to buy my first guitar, um, and so I built a guitar out of cardboard while while I was waiting. And Brilliant. I, I had a just cord get the board. positions ready. Yeah. So you're ready to go. Yeah, I, did, I was. I was yeah. totally ready. I'd, I'd, I'd learned all the, all the chords. I didn't know what they sounded like, but I was like, yeah. C's here, yeah. D's here. And then when the guitar turned up, I could kind of Brilliant. do it already. Brilliant. Sort of. Forward thinking. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Um, so the, so the first things you played were kind of like the pop stuff of the day. No, not even right. that. It, right. was, it was literally straight in with uh, just making... Sound stuff up. Yeah, we, we, we had a we had a mix of instruments. We we had a, we had a really good drummer who had a proper drum kit, um, and then uh, another.
another another guy with um with, uh, he was in the boys brigade and, and he had a snare drum and then uh, someone was on one of those air powered keyboards right bon tempi do you remember those yeah things? yeah yeah air powered is it like if you if, if you put all your if you put all the keys down it would it would go ha ah, ah, ha ah, ha sort of like run out brilliant of um someone on the mouth organ um i don't think we had a bass guitar at the time and then just me on the guitar just making a terrible noise terrible but we absolutely loved it you know great so when did you decide that you thought you might want to do music as a career or just be a, you know when did you when did you realize you were quite good at playing the guitar <laughs> well i mean obviously it takes quite a long time doesn't it but I, mm. I, I did take to it like a duck to water i have to say um my, my older brother had a uh, had this lovely guitar it was like a les paul copy and when he was out i used to sneak up there and, and you know, <laughs> play on his guitar and he, he had this uh, amp it was an atec amp it was uh, no one's ever heard of it um, before or since um, but it was great if you turned it up full but it was too loud so he used to put a pillow over the top of it and just crank out the distortion you know um, and he used to have guitar lessons and I, I used to learn I used to hear what he so was you doing. had second hand guitar yes. lessons well yeah. no not exactly I used to yeah. just hear what he was playing yeah I just you know oh, I can do that and um, and then uh, I very quickly got a lot better better than him on the guitar which right. he, I don't think he liked at all to be honest no what's the age difference He's a couple of years above me. Right. So does he play now still? No, no. But uh, yeah, I know. I think I think it annoyed him. It was just one more reason to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we do some playing? Yeah, um, well, sure. Yeah, play. let's do that. Yeah, let's, okay. uh, let's kick off with. Uh... Yeah, just mute these mics. Thank you. 
you've still got it. <laughs> Great stuff. Swinging sounds great, guys. Evening, everybody. It's good. Jim Trimmer. Hello, Jim. Uh, Paul Smart. Evening, Nigel. Roll on next year when we can have a look back at the live. Look, look back live at the clock tower. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ross Maxwell with a oh, cheers really? sort of oh, thing. Hello, yeah. Ross. Yeah. Ross is a big part of the history. We'll, we'll talk about him. A John Lilly says nice hat. Oh, thank you. It was it's to cover up my uh, lockdown big wig. <laughs> <laughs> So we're getting a little bit, uh, yes, a little bit sorry for the uh, the hairdressing industry. They've lost millions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mind you, they've got a lot of hair to cut, haven't they? Off to, so, I think I think they were so. I mean, uh, not for me, but apparently the the queues and the the waiting list for hairdressers after lockdown was just ridiculous. Oh really? You pretty much charge what they like and just <laughs> oh, not bother answering this, anybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to look a bit like Farrah Fawcett. Um, okay, so. Yeah, um, first gigs. What, when did you first start playing live or you know playing publicly? Uh, what for money? You mean or at all? Yeah, well, uh, either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember the, the the very first gig was was actually with that very first band, and we we, we somehow taught the school into putting on a gig, gig right. in front of the whole school, and it was uh, it was recorded as well. And uh, I, I, I've kind of made it my life's mission to find all those cassettes and destroy them. <laughs> so, <laughs> They're probably worth a lot of money today. <laughs> so I, I, I know of some people who've, who've still got them. Um, that and do you know that you're still in contact with the other members of the band? Are you yeah, still, I am, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, so that might be a reunion gig coming up then. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm up for it. I, yeah. I, I think our musical taste might have uh, diversified <laughs> slightly since. Um, well, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Did you ever have these, those band out arguments of like which direction you were going to go in? And I like this, and let's do that. <laughs> uh, was there was there a designated leader who said no? He had the final word on things. God, do, do you know it's so long ago that I, 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 I remember there being a, a you know a little bit of um, a little bit of beef here and there. But it was, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it. it, it, it I mean, it, in my mind, it lasted forever, but it was probably only a few months, really. Yeah. And of course, then <laughs> school finished, and we all went off to our separate schools. And, Oh right, so this was in your primary school, was it? Yeah, we were in all. Uh, this was the last year, so we were eleven. Wow, that's great. So, yeah, so yeah, I mean, it was just great. I, I, I was bitten by the bug, sort of, you know, immediately. Yeah. Playing. So did you continue this into pri into your secondary school? Yes, uh, and actually stayed in contact with. Um, uh, um, it was it was it was main, mainly the drummer Paul Paul Soden. He's, he's a great drummer, absolutely brilliant. He he, he blossomed into one of. The, the best funk drummers I've ever heard, you know. Great. And um, he does he does still play, but uh, he's, he's now a very talented furniture builder uh, living down the south I'm coast. I'm just going to give you a bit more level on the mics. Am I speaking too quietly? Yeah. How's that? Yeah, it looks better. Slightly more, yes. I'll try and speak up a little bit. That's okay. Um, yeah, so... I guess that continued on to your, like your secondary school. When you left school, did, did were you ever thinking about doing music professionally? Yeah, I mean, I I, I really wanted to do it, but um, if you if you didn't have um, like uh, proper lessons at school, then the music department didn't really want to know. I remember I, I went in for house music one year, and of course I was a bit of a rocker by this time. This was a few years on, about four years down the road, and I was fully sold up for ACDC and. Right. Iron Maiden and all that sort of thing, Led Zepp and all that. So uh, I did like a uh, like a sort of medley of um, um, of my favourite rock tunes, you know, for house music. And I thought uh, I'm I'm gonna t I'm just gonna blow the roof off the place. No, I, I, I was I was offended. I was so offended by that. Really? So I'd, 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 I'd spent so long putting putting that sort of thing together. And so yeah, but but there, there was a great music scene though. Like at, at school, there were loads of bands. Um, and I sort of flitted between uh, a lot of them. Um, there was a great band called, um, they started off calling themselves the Mannix. Uh, right. And then of course the Mannix Street Preachers came along and they had to change their name. And it's, uh, um, there was a great guitarist, John McMurtry, who ended up becoming um, a great photographer and he became Iron Maiden's photographer. Oh wow. And uh, it's actually, you can see him on the documentaries, he's on the flight and all that. Right. And he's a very right. talented guy and yeah. brilliant guitarist. Um, and there, were, uh, there was another band called The Hunger. Um, that, that was the band. There was, there, there, there was just a great, 
um, uh, like Battle of the Bands scene going on, and all, it's like down at Linton's Lane Youth Centre and all, all sorts of places. And we get really excited about it. We uh, we knocked up our own little kind of goth band called the Clams, and it was just. I mean, it, did it you dye your hair black? black? Uh, no, I didn't, but I, I, a lot of people did. I, I, I once tried to crimp my hair, and it didn't really right. work out. <laughs> but I was I was always much more of a rocker. Um, but yeah, playing playing old Cure songs and right. Joy Division and stuff. Yeah, like that. I had a I had a friend at school, and um, he was my first the first person I ever started playing with, and uh, he was a great rock guitarist. And then he joined a similar sort of, sort of similar sort of thing. He joined a the kind of alternative band right. doing Cure songs and all that kind of stuff. And he went from being um, average Joe, who would just you know everybody would pass him in the street to the coolest guy <laughs> ever because he had this spiky black hair and he wore all these black clothes and right. he just became the coolest kid yeah, ever yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, 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 I'd ask him as a big kind of goth scene you know it's yeah. uh, into the uh, they used to be called the southern death cult and they're death cult and then they became right. the cult right and you know it's uh, and then they had a massive hit with She Sells Sanctuary yeah yeah all of a sudden they were too commercial and it was you know what I mean? It was all yeah, about the yeah, underground yeah. sort of right, thing. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, because I, I do remember that song, yeah. It was a great tune, great song. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it was a great scene, but it's um, somehow, musically, some of it, it, it wasn't that great. Yeah. You know, I, 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 but I, the good, good thing about that music was real players. Yes. You know, so those guitar bands are real musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Having to do it rather than... Yeah. Because the kind of the 80s thing as well was a very produced... Stock Aitken and Waterman thing that was probably going at the same parallel time. Yes, well that's true, and uh, and it, it was a shame that that, that came along uh, in a way because that, that that really was that sounded the death knell for the for the indie band. You know, we we used to turn on like uh, well back to top of the pops, and there'd be bands like I don't know, I just 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 plucking them out of the out of the air, but like Pig Bag. I remember they were from somewhere up north. I can't remember where, but it, I, and. Papa's got a brand new pig bag. I don't know all these novelty bands or whatever, yeah. and you always felt that you you potentially have the chance of actually making it on there one day. Yeah. So yeah. Um, years later, when when they when they can top of the pops, I was I was really quite upset about that. <laughs> you know, I just felt like there wasn't a route in anymore. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think when I was a teenager and that uh, th that sort of age, that was my goal in life. Yeah. To play on top of the pops. And yeah. Become a pop star. Yeah, kind of it's uh, how things have changed, though. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, but of course, you know, uh, as you as as you get older, you you, you kind of slowly re renegotiate, don't you? You know, you, you sort of realise that you're not going to be a pop star, and all the, all, all these dreams you had when you were a kid, they're they're not going to work out. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, unless you're very lucky. Yeah, you know, kind of knew a couple of people who who almost got there. Um, and back then, you kind of lived the life as well. You kind of were. The, you know maybe on the dole or something or you, you squatted in some you know dodgy flat or something <laughs> and you all had this mission and this was the you know your purpose and yeah you had this goal that you know we didn't whenever you know didn't matter what it took this is what you wanted yeah, to achieve that's and right do. you get in the back of a van and off you go and yeah it, it, it if i mean it it feels like that that's gone now not not completely gone i i, I know there are some bands still doing it yeah. but where's the teenage shout now it just yeah. seems to be full of boy bands or, or, yeah. or whatever yeah. very, very safe music that's kind of pre pre-prepared and then even the guitar bands that i can think of recently um oh I'm trying to think they, i can't remember they, they, they were kind of i can't remember what they were called but they they're very very produced i'm trying to think of the name of this band and they were like a couple of guitarists different singers and think, in fact i think the drummer was on strictly come dancing do you know the band i mean um, only, only I was very out of students. Touch. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, you know, they they seem to be very manufactured now as well. Even yeah, though, yeah. Even those. And then once in a while, a really great a great guitar band comes along. I remember when the Darkness came along. Yeah, I yeah, that's great. Right. And they did, um, were they from East Anglia or something? They were from Lower Stuff. Yeah. yeah. And there was uh, uh, Justin Haw Hawking, wasn't it? It's Hawkins. Um, something like he that. He was he was on uh, Jules Holland and. and uh, he jumped on the piano and did a great big the splits off it, and he was like a proper. He was the Freddie Mercury type. Yeah, character. man, and yeah. it was like, yes, you know, this yeah. is it's happening all over again. This is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know, they just seem to disappear, but. Yeah. yeah. So you were kind of a shredder then. You would. Uh... Well, I thought I was, but I, actually, right. my technique was never any good. I, um, I never really had 
any lessons to speak of. And uh, right. I, I wasn't very good at the old, you know, tremolo sort of picking and all that sort of thing. Well, there's, there's, there's those guys who do the speed picking now, aren't, aren't they? they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I did, that was that was another thing. I mean, it was, I was into the sort of new wave of British heavy metal and uh, Iron Maiden. And I, I, I remember Dave Murray, the guitarist, was going out with a mate's sister, and it was like, oh wow, you know, it all, it all, they're still cool. But then there was another sort of raft of bands came up, and it was all about hairspray and massive hair. Well, you know, sorry, sorry about this, but bigger <laughs> hair than mine. And it just got a bit silly, you know. Yeah. I remember I, uh, I remember buying an Ingui Malmsteen record. And I absolutely hated it, but the but the guitar solos were fantastic. Yeah. So I so I. He was like a Paganini on the guitar, yeah, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. So I taped all the guitar solos and then smashed the album because <laughs> I, I didn't want to be associated with it. To secretly love the guitar playing. Yeah, yeah. But there was something exciting about those guitar solos. You know, oh yeah. That I thought the the energy that, and to a certain degree, when I got into jazz and heard you know players like Coltrane and right. Parker and you know and Cannonball and all those people that people that played with so much energy and burn you know the burning players. Yeah, there was a parallel to those guitar gods that yes. you know that I kind of could well it, see. It, it it was it was for that reason that I, that I'd moved across into sort of fusion you know I did, this was after getting into like Thin Lizzy quite he- heavily and uh, I actually moved down to Brighton with with a couple of friends of mine, um, one of which was the bass player in the original band, uh, my best mate Miles um, Miles Armstrong whose dad actually got me into jazz um, I was going to um, ask you what the connection was how did you go from these, the indie scene to well uh, my mate Miles used to live uh, just in the next road to me and just you know, like we, I used to go around there all the time um, in fact it got it, it got to the stage where you just you'd, you'd pick up the phone you know dial, dial on yeah. the old Baker Light phone and then you'd just go eh, and he'd go eh <laughs> and he just went out coming over, you know. Yeah. So uh, his own vocabulary. Yeah, and yeah. and his, his his dad would it would uh, he he'd quite often be dancing around the room, listening to jazz records, and it was uh, oh, okay. a fantastic Bang and Olufsen kind of system, you know. Yeah. It, it was like, wow, what's this? And uh, it was it was just a completely different world. So this is kind of when you left school, was it just after? Uh, no, it was it was towards the end. It was like f- age fifteen, sort of sixteen, sort of time. Cool. And you moved to Brighton. Uh, no, I, this was I. I then took a, a terrible um, turn in life, and um, well, it was getting to the end of school, and I, um, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do, and I wasn't going to go to university, and you know, there just didn't seem to be any opportunities to do anything. Right. And uh, my brother had recently, my older brother had just recently joined the Royal Marines, and he was coming back all sort of windswept and interesting, and I thought, what the hell? Yeah. Let's just go for it. You know. Yeah. I, I, I kind of got kicked out of school, and um, which is a long story. And, uh, um, so I, I, I ended up um, in a part-time dry cleaning job in Tolworth, and it was just the, it was just the most dismal thing. Right. There was uh, there was a woman who used to work there, Barbara. I'm, I'm sure she's not with us anymore. But there was um, she used to have a cigarette on a break, and uh, or, or on all the breaks. And there was there were two shelves, and there was an ashtray on the bottom shelf, and she used to leave a cigarette on the bottom shelf and on the bottom of the upper shelf was just this black tar from like 30 years of cigarette breaks <laughs> and I remember looking at it thinking I've got to get out of here man I've yeah. got to get out of here so uh, yeah I, I, um, I went to Surbiton and went to the um, the army recruitment place and uh, signed on the dotted line and before Brilliant. I knew it just I so was, did you have to I mean did you have to have sort of some sort of test or interview or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They don't just take anybody. No, they don't take anyone. <laughs> no, see, I mean it's actually quite a rigorous uh, sort yeah. of thing. I mean, like the physical, didn't you have to be able to like run with a backpack on for? Well, I mean, you don't a start miles like that. or something. They, right. they, you know, you get you, you slowly get. Um, yeah, they slowly introduce that sort of thing. But I mean, I was fit. Yeah, you know, yeah, very fit. And uh, obviously, when you know you you're just about to get tested on your fitness, then. Um, and you really go for it, you know. I, don't, I was, I was fit as a flea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how <laughs> that was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that must have been a life, complete life change. Um, yeah. The discipline, I guess, and and having that kind of regimental way of life, I guess. Yeah. No, I did. I did. It was crazy, and I, I, I think leaving school made me realise how much. Although I said I hated school, that. Um, I kind of loved being up against the man, 
if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like always fighting against something. Yeah. And, and without that, I was totally lost. Right. I, I, just life has always, I've always battled through, even if there's no battle really. Right. <laughs> I sort of like, go and find one. Yeah. And, uh, and that was, yeah, I mean, the army certainly filled that hole. Right. It was like school, but they're 10 times worse. Right. And it was, yeah. So did you enjoy it when you first signed up? Did you enjoy No, it? no. I didn't at all. I was, right. I was, I was, I was going to get out. And it's, um, right. but it, um, you have these, uh, they're called DORs or discharge on request. And you, you've got three months, I think it's three months or six weeks to just say, don't want to do this anymore. And then um, the moment you do that, you put on the orange tracksuit and you just get, you are scum. You just like the lowest form of life. Yeah. Get beaten up and you know, do, do all the terrible jobs. And I thought, I don't want to do that either. You know? No. So, um, how, how do I leave discreetly? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, they, they, people used to. They used, right. to, used to run, you know. Yeah. You'd get yeah. people disappearing and then they'd, they'd get picked up by the military, military police. Military police. Oh, God. So it was, yeah, it was a door that was very easy to open and very hard to close. Right. So, uh, so how long were you in the services for? Three years, 262 days. It's very specific. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what it says on my discharge. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so did, did you, you posted... I think you told me you went to Northern Ireland. I did, yeah. Right. It's, uh, I, I, I remember um, all the postings coming in on... Uh, we, we were on the drill square up in um, uh, Hexham, up in um, uh, just north of Newcastle. And um, all our postings were being read out. And uh, and they were calling us privates, oh, you know, rather than recruits. And it was right. like, um, going through so-and-so, Private Smith, uh, British Army, the Rhine, Germany. All right, OK. And then mine came along. Private Price... Hollywood. And I was like, I'm going to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard this voice saying, it's not where you think it is. And I was like, oh no, this is Northern Ireland. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was quite, quite, um, quite a shock to the system. Yeah. And these, I guess, in sort of the troubles, I guess, it's sort of not long after that, was it? Uh, it was right in the middle of it, really, at 87 right. to 89. Right. And so, uh, you know, when Michael Stone was throwing around grenades and those those signalers, you know, ended up getting... Oh, about around the time of the Brighton bomb, I guess, wasn't it? Uh, it's a bit later than that. Right. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, there was there was plenty plenty of stuff going on there. Right. And it was it was a world that I didn't know anything about. I didn't know anything about the history or, or anything. So it was quite a, a baptism of fire, you know. Um, it's quite dangerous, actually. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. we didn't, we didn't all come home, you know. Right, I mean? yeah. I was going to so say that, yeah. So you must have been afraid for your life. Yeah, but when you when you're 18, you just don't care, do you? You know, you're, yeah. you're invincible, and I was yeah. really up for it. Um, but I I very quickly saw the whole injustice of it, um, and uh, there were a lot of people in in the forces over there who who really really signed up for the oh yeah you know stick with the loyalists and the anti IRA thing, and I could see the whole the whole picture, and I just thought what a tragic situation this whole mm. thing is, all because Henry VIII wanted to. <laughs> we need to get yeah. married. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how how people in 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 uh, positions of power can alter the course of human existence. Yeah, you know, it's just unbelievable. And then you see how indoctrinated it is as well. You just it defies logic, doesn't it? You know how people can be so, you know, one way or the other on this side, the Catholic side or the Protestant side, or you know, and nothing's going to change them. You know, that's. Yeah, going to be like that to the grave. Yeah, yeah, and their kids are going to be like that. And that's true. I mean, I, you know, I mean, once once people have been killed on either side, I mean, you'd never you'd never forgive or forget no. that. And no. uh, that, those those cuts run really deep. Um, but actually, I, I I went I went back to um, uh, I played at the the the, um, the Derry Jazz Festival. I was invited over there, just me, and I was I was a bit worried about it. I, I, I hadn't been. <laughs> Somebody's going to come up with a charge sheet. <laughs> well, right, we something. got him. We got him back. <laughs> I, you know, I said, so I, you know, I touched down at, uh, at, at is it Alder, 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 Gro, Alder Grove? I can't remember the name of the airport now in uh, Belfast, and then I'm, I'm in the back of a back of a taxi, you know, being driven out to, uh, you know, to, to Derry, and um, all the while thinking, is this just, is you know, I, I, I can just imagine the taxi driving into the woods and the guy turning around and saying, Nigel. There is no jazz festival, <laughs> <laughs> but actually they were the sweetest people, and I, I, yeah. I, 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 I had a couple of chats with people about the troubles and all that sort of thing, and uh, and invariably it was like we're done with this. This is that's that's old news now, you know. And of course there are there are some some pockets of it remaining, and of course I mean who wouldn't? Um, I mean let's not get all political about it, but I mean I'm sure if I was, you know. 
uh, from from the province, and I was having to, you know, um, somehow uh, digest the, uh, how awful the British government was. I'm sure I'd have been, you know, mm. up for any kind of uh, resistance myself. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, great mm. stuff. So, um, when you left the army, yes. Did you have an idea what you wanted to do? Or? Yeah, totally. I, um, I'd, I'd done a little bit of moonlighting, actually. Um, right. And I'd, I got together with this, this guy, Dave, Dave Eaton, um, who was, uh, he was like a singer, uh, pianist. And he was really good. And he, did, he made a great sound. He had all the, all the gear. And he was out doing gigs in the working men's clubs and all that sort of thing. And, um, and we got on like a house on fire. And uh, so i just sort of turn up and, you know, uh, he'd, he'd have all the music there with doing... I mean, we used to do some Chaz and Dave. Brilliant. <laughs> we used to yeah. call ourselves Nigel and Dave. <laughs> and, uh, well, you've got the hat now, so... Yeah. You were, oh, God. Yes. No, I'm going to take it off now you've said that. Uh, and then we had some great times. And um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever made so much money. Brilliant. It was... Uh, and it was... Uh, I mean, I had people in the army telling me, like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, if you can do this, what, what are you doing here? Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think I've basically finally listened to them and thought yeah what the hell am I doing here so uh, got the hell out of there and of course you know some people used to leave um, and then you know flick the visas they're leaving I'm out of here and then six months later you'd, you'd see them walking back through the door <laughs> see, there's nothing out there yeah nothing out yeah. there but me I was determined never to go back and um, I didn't thank god brilliant stuff no it's great it's really interesting though um and I guess it's, it wasn't so bad staying in for three years as opposed to staying in for three months. You didn't have to wear the orange ja- orange jumpsuit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess if if I'd have bailed, I, I would have I would have always thought I failed at something. Right. But you know, I, I ended up getting promoted, and um, it was the youngest promotion they'd ever seen in the regiment. I think. Great. And it's, um, although I mean, they only gave it to me so I could sign documents when I was working in intelligence. Intelligence. Uh, <laughs> me. Um, but yeah, so I was Lance Corporal Price and. Uh, yeah. Great. It was all right. Yeah. Should we do another tune? Yes. I've forgotten why we're here. <laughs> so, um, right. Uh, what did we say we were going to do? Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
Nigel Price, everybody. How about that? Uh, just look at the comments. Everyone's saying sounding good. Uh, that's it, really. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. That's, that's better than the other option. Are there any? Yeah. Uh, did, does she mean pasties? Do you mean pasties, Esther? Or Scotch So I'm eggs. guessing this is something to do with uh, the whole discussion about the food. Uh, about, uh, did she, I think she's looking for something more substantial. <laughs> um, yeah, Sc- Scotch eggs, I think. Scotch eggs, that's it, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're foray into kind of jazz and kind of like mainstream jazz and bebop and all this kind of stuff that you kind of play now. Yes. How, how did we arrive from the fusion stuff to... Well, it was... Um, I really threw myself into that, you know, and right. uh, I, was, I was still playing with that original drummer, you know, right. Paul, um, and we managed to get a, a band of people together and, you know, I wanted violin, I wanted electric violin, I wanted my Jerry Goodman or my uh, Jean-Luc Ponty. Um, and uh, we got um, this young lady called Anne, Amber, Amber Ross, I think her name was, so it was great, man. We got this, you know, we got the electric violin, we got the guitar, we got the drums, we got, uh, we managed to get a, a keyboard player. It was, it was, it was funny actually, um, because we advertised for a keyboard player and a, a guy called Ben Henderson turned up with a saxophone. <laughs> and it was, but it was, you know, we were sort of a bit come see, come saw in those days, kind yeah. of. But, um, uh, and uh, we had a great bass player who do live fairly locally, Alex Kidd. He was a monster bass player, and we had a singer called um, Raf, um, who sadly died. Actually, I don't say that's, enough. that's a long story, but uh, yeah. So we, we we had this band together, and we used to thrash out these amazing, kind of fusiony, jazz rocky uh, sort of arrangements. But it's very hard to keep it together. Right. And it was um, a little bit of politics going on, and because you, I guess you were a band. Well, I guess yeah. we were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, we did a few gigs. And um, but it was just it was a little bit hard to keep it together, and I do, I just I kind of got a bit tired of the whole band politic sort of thing. It was such a such a cumbersome beast, you know, yeah. like to move yeah. around. And I, I just it led me to thinking, man, you know, if I could just play straight ahead jazz. Oh, and by this time, I, I, I discovered um, that I wasn't ever going to play like John McLaughlin, and it was I got a bit down about it actually. Uh, and then I heard Wes Montgomery. And I just thought, oh man, you know, there's another way. Uh, just yeah. a very melodic, you know, real sort of feel good, kind of chunky, swinging sort of way of getting through. Um, and of course, I was aware of the jazz scene anyway. And uh, I, I just thought about it. And I thought, well, you know, I love this music enough. If I could just get, you know, if, if I could learn enough standards and if I could get good enough at this, then I could potentially go out without the band. <laughs> and, um, and uh, by this time, I'd, I'd, I'd started playing with, uh, uh, with a bunch of guys um, doing like our Sunday afternoon, well, who uh, is no longer with us, actually. My God. So I've got the kiss of death, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't mention me player. in any of your... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a great bass player called Ross Maxwell, who's uh, apparently listening. Oh, great. Um, he's probably listening from some uh, sun-kissed island in, in, in Greece. He's, right. uh, he's got life sorted out. Um, great guitarist called Paul Herman who, who went on went on to take over wild basses and he's great at building and fit and repairing guitars um, and yeah so uh, so my first jazz gig came along and it was actually Dominic's dad Keith who uh, who said um, he just asked me if I could t- do a gig down in Bosom Bay actually where on earth is that uh, where, what's that where on earth is that Bosom Bay it's, it's, it's down the south coast and it's, it's, it's this place where you if uh, you have to keep an eye on the tide because if you park oh, too close right. to the sea yeah. then your car's going to end up under underwater um, and uh, we were driving down there I, d- I didn't drive I didn't learn to drive till I was 30 um, I was just driving down there and I, I thought I'd better mention that I'd never done a, a jazz gig before <laughs> you never thinking he was going to say don't worry you'll be fine hey, well, you could have bloody well told me <laughs> and I was absolutely terrified you know Yeah. Um, I can't remember the bass player's name now but it was just a trio gig and I just went out and played the standards that I knew, and it was great. Great. And I thought, I can do this now. I know, you know, I had like 60 quid or whatever it was. Yeah. So I've done it. You know, I can make money out of music. Yeah. Those gigs are still 60 quid, though. Well, it, well it's <laughs> probably gone down, actually. So, um, and then it was just a case of uh, just having a look at, like, jazz in London or whatever, and just going around to all the jam sessions and, and just trying to meet people. Great. So I ended up sort of leaving my... Um, I didn't completely leave my friends behind. 
but I started to make new acquaintances in up in the London, in the big know, smoke, yeah, up in the big smoke, and um, yeah, a very, uh, very quickly um, got on the scene, bumped into just, all sorts yeah, of yeah, people, and, yeah. and, and then suddenly there was gigs, and uh, yeah, it just slowly got better and better over the years. Yeah. So, how did you end up playing with the James Taylor Quartet? Ha! Well, I'd, um, there's a, there's a great gig down in um, Rochester, uh, down at the Eagle. Um, I say there, there is, there was when there was a live music scene, and um, I was a bit of a favourite down there. I used to take the organ trio down there, right? And uh, we had some great gigs, and um, some of which have, have been captured on YouTube. And um, and uh, this is related. It is. It's quite a strange turn of events. Um, James Taylor used to go to school with Nitin Sawney. Oh yeah, he's a percussionist. Guy, yeah, isn't he? yeah, yeah, right. great, a great guy, and um, he's allergic to dogs. This 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 does link up. Um, and James had just got a dog, and so he couldn't stay in the house. And he said, oh, "Well, let's go down the pub then." And James is like, "Oh, well, let's go down the Eagle. They've got jazz on a Sunday." And James walked in, and there was me giving it the large one, you know, right. doing my best to sound like George Benson or whatever. And um, he just marched up to me and said, "Do you want to join my band?" And I went, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> and that was it and, brilliant uh, yeah and um, and that was it so he just hired you on hearing you play in the in yeah the, just in the, the local pub that's just, uh, just 300 yards from his house and um, I, I mean I had this terrible fear of flying actually and I hadn't right. flown in years and uh, actually um, the year before I'd, I'd played some gigs with Pee Wee Ellis and oh, wow. um, yeah. and he'd, he'd asked me to join his band and, and, and go um, flying around Europe and I was like oh man you know, can you give me 24 hours to think about it because I had this terrible fear of flying the first gig was in Vienna and I was like oh god can you just let me think about it and of course they just took it as a bit of a slur I think and then just got someone else you know. Right. so right. I thought the next time that happens I'm just going to say yes well, what the hell so of course I knew it was coming and, uh, and the first gig that came in with, with James Taylor Quartet was in Vienna <laughs> I was like oh, come on then let's do it and it was um it was right. a, it was an awful flight, just awful turbulence, and it was just absolutely terrible. Right. It was worse than I thought it was going to be. Really, I ended up just flying virtually every weekend, I mean, especially through the summer for about right. three years. And were you sort of married with the kids and all that kind of stuff? Because you got you you're quite yes. young when you were married uh, and had kids. Yeah, well, I, I was I was twenty six. Yeah, so, so uh, and are your kids named after jet, famous jazz well, players? Well, sort of. Because I've I seen mean, you type their names on on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> I think one's well, Herbie and Miles. Yeah, and, Miles, Herbie yeah. and Ella. I mean, it was, yeah. it was always going to be Ella. Yeah. I mean, um, me and Bianca, we, you know, we, 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 we kind of, um, when we first got together, we, we found that, you know, that our, our musical taste linked up with Ella Fitzgerald. And we always liked the name and it was, it was always going to be that, but we just didn't have a girl. And then, um, I don't know, it was just putting names into a hat, really. And it's, um, so it wasn't really intentional, but it is funny, actually. But I hope they don't hate us for it. <laughs> <laughs> They've, they've grown into their names now. Sure, yeah. 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 And they still, do they go by their first names? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and it was, it, it was actually, um, I mean, I thought, oh God, my life's over now, you know, I'm just about to be a dad. You know, I've got nowhere. I've, I've, I'd, I'd, I'd done a little bit of touring around Europe and um, we used to support the Scatterlights, um, right. which was great. You know, like the original guys, the... Uh, Roland Alfonso and Tommy McCook and Lloyd Brevet, Lloyd Nibs and all that. Like they, they, they invented like ska and reggae music, and to actually, you know, feel that you were a part of that was amazing. Um, and uh, so when uh, you know, the the birth was impending, you know, I remember a tour was coming in, and it was like, well, you can't do that. And I was like, oh, oh. and I thought, oh God, my life's over. Um, and I just thought, well. If I don't put in the practice now, I'm, 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 I don't know if I'm ever going to get the chance again. Yeah. So I, I really knuckled down and started really practicing for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, every day, you know, first thing, metronome and all these scales and all that sort of thing. And then um, the baby came along, of course, Miles, the first one. And uh, of course, the whole world turned. I just went out and practiced and I went and did it and no one, no one said a word. In fact, I think they were probably quite pleased to get rid of me. Right. <laughs> um, so I just kept it up, and it, it just became a thing. I knew I'd be left alone if I was out there, so I just kept it up and really put some time in. So you like had a spare room or like a? It was like it a... was actually a kind of lean-to out out the back of my mother-in-law's house. 
So it was all weathers. So even if it was freezing cold, I'd be out there with a metronome, my fingerless gloves, you know, brilliant, practicing all the scales. And that's where you kind of really worked on your chops and yeah, really kind of yeah, you know, I, I knew that I didn't really know. Well, I must have been playing for eleven years by that point. Um, is it eleven years? No, it must have been longer than that. Fourteen. I can't. I can't do maths. Uh, I don't know. Hang on. Is it fifteen years? Fifteen years. Yeah. But I, I knew I had to get better. So I, I really tried. Put the work in. Yeah. 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 I think it needs to be done, doesn't it? I think well, there's no getting away from it, is there? Anyone who can play has put the hours in. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they, they talk about Chet Baker saying, oh, we never practiced. Of course he did. You don't just get to be able to play like that by mm. chance, you know. No. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that, I, that really started my relationship with practicing and, you know, properly with a, with a proper system. So uh, that's not the question you asked at all, is it? Um, but I, that was kind of related to having the kids come along. Yeah, yeah, so. um, that's great. And then I guess move on to the jazz guitars and something similar to what you're playing now, I guess. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah. I mean, what was I playing before? I, I can't remember. I, I remember it was '94 that I, I walked into the local music shop. Sadly, not there anymore. Uh, bootleg music in Epsom. And I just saw this Gibson ES135 hanging on the wall, and I was like that's the one right so I just took it off the wall I never got it set up or anything like that I just played it and I absolutely wore that thing out right um, I mean are you a, a geek when it comes to guitars and setups no. and strings and well and yeah I, mean, I, stuff? I know I know what I like but I don't know much about guitars right you know about models and all that sort of thing I just know what I like I love that famous story I think it's um, I think it's the bass player from Chic Bernard Edwards is it okay somebody asked him in uh in some interview, what strings are used? And he says, the, the ones they came with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was a little bit like that. I, yeah. I, I remember about when I had that guitar to have some work done it, and they said, um, they, asked, they asked me, you know, how I liked it set up. And I said, don't know, I've never had it set up. <laughs> I literally just took it off the shelf and just played it. Yeah. And uh, slowly got chunkier and chunkier strings. And I was just trying to slow myself down. Right. Because I was a bit of a, you know, used to whiz around a little bit too much for my liking. So I got, and, and I love the sound of, you know, like the, the jazz guitar, which seems to be really big. And big full sound. And I, I There's a really great quote, isn't there, from Wes Montgomery that I heard that George Benson said that George Benson's telling the story that's saying that um, Wes had heard him play and he said, oh no, I think he was chatting to him. Wes said to him, you're going to be a really great player when you slow down. <laughs> or something like something to that yeah. sort of, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot in that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you play too fast, people, people don't know what the hell you're doing anyway. You know, except other guitarists. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, and then I, d I, d I guess I just slowly found out what I liked. Right. And, um, I mean, that's that's led me to this. Although you didn't ask about this. But no, I was going to ask. I do. Is that one of your? Is, it, is that the Nigel Price? It is my signature model guitar. guitar yeah. yeah. And I d I, it's 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 been a sort of evolution, and it's sort of finding out that you like a long scale. You like a wide flat neck is this the first one that you had built no I, I had one built in uh, 2004 that was the one after the Gibson um, by Charlie Crabtree who lived down in Lewis he sadly died um, that was really sad actually um, and yeah I mean that, that was a great guitar and it, it, that was uh, this is very guitar-y now um, but I had I had the neck um built on there so it was sticking further out so I'd have more access to the, the dusty end oh okay um, but actually it was probably a little bit too far and I actually ended up sort of moving down the guitar a little bit and having to use a footrest and all that right so I had that done with this one but just not quite as far and it's actually it's worked out really well do you want it at the 15th fret which is quite unusual you know so it's quite a long guitar did you find it you had any Doing all those hours practicing and, and all the hours playing, did you ever get any guitar-related problems, posture? Yeah, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I did. Um, and I, I knew I knew people that uh, you know they'd give up because they had RSI and that sort of thing. And I just thought oh, that just sounded horrifying to me. Mm. So I just thought I'm just going to play through it, no matter how much it hurts. And I, I tried to keep myself physically fit, and chuck a load of weights around, and and I've, I've had terrible things like tennis elbow and all sorts of stuff going on um, but somehow I just played through it all just get through it yeah it just feels like if you don't worry about it it can't hurt you <laughs> or maybe I've just been lucky yeah that's good you never had to give up any gigs you've never been kind of no. off on the no. injured list I mean, even, even when I, I, mean, I broke my hand really badly um, 
a few years back and this finger doesn't work anymore oh, wow. so um which is a good excuse not to play finger style because i've never really good at it anyway right but i mean somehow it's 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 just evolution and now i'm not strong enough to with this finger to put it down so i've ended up this is very technical now but um i've had this put on my uh scratch plate i should mention it's uh, fibonacci guitar by the way but fibonacci built this for me um so it's like a plateau it's like going along at the same height as a string so i can just rest my hand on it oh great so because it's a little bit sort of right not working very well probably get but a blue a bit, badge for that <laughs> <laughs> blue badge. but i remember when i broke my hand i mean yeah. it, it was it was horrendous I, um uh, i remember doing a gig with Giorgio mancio and literally having to take the bandage off you know my hand was huge it's like a tennis ball on it and i still did the gig you know there was just no way i was going to stop gigging no brilliant and i actually should have had it rebroken and and fixed but I do you find you do you get problems with it in cold weather and no. wet days or anything no, no it's fine but um uh, yeah i just never really let anything get in the way you know? great it's a great attitude attitude so i mean that's the guitar you've also got a custom amp have you not uh, well, yeah, kind of. It's um, it, it, this was uh, I walked into Boysdale in um, in Victoria one night, and my my amp wouldn't work, um, so I had to use one of the house amps, and it was uh, an old Session M seventy five, which was my first amp actually. Right. And I put a little Facebook post up saying, "Oh, you know, I'm using one of these," and uh, someone spotted it on Facebook, and and they they knew Stuart down at Session, and, and uh, they said, "Oh, I should, I should put you in touch with this guy." So I got in touch with him, and he, he's passionate about uh, the fact that transistor amps can sound as good as valve amps, and um, which I didn't realise at the time. And I, I spoke to him on the phone, and he said, uh, um, he said, basically offered offered me an amp, you know. And, and I said, well, look, it's a transistor, and I use valve amps, which is kind of the best thing I could have said because he yeah. got really annoyed. Yeah. And uh, he said, look, <laughs> just bring your amp down, put it next to put it next to mine, and see what you think. And so I took my Messer Boogie Rocket 44 down there, plonked it, plonked it down there, and I was like, oh my god, this does actually sound amazing, and it doesn't hiss. I mean, you wouldn't even know it's on. Yeah. Whereas some of those valve yeah. amps, they're just they're more trouble than they're worth. You know? Right. And actually, you know, for jazz, I find you just don't need you don't need that kind of awesome power. No. You know, it's it's like the sound is it's somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I can't quite explain where it is, but I, I, I know I know the sound when it when I hear it. And yeah, it's, it's there for me, you know. Yeah. So, um, um, but I wasn't quite happy with the sweeps of tone on it, so I said, "Oh, could you change these to uh, cater for a darker sort of jazzier sound?" And so he did. And this is the own the world's only J forty five. They haven't gone into production yet, but Brilliant. Um, yeah. So hopefully, um, hopefully, we'll do that at some point. Great stuff. Yeah. And what about your favourite players? Who are, you, who, are you, who are the guys you go to? Do, do you, do you, who, who, whose sound do you like? Do you, do you, I know everyone's trying to get their own sound, but do you, is anyone you think, oh, that, I'd love to sound like that person. That's, that person's got the greatest tone. And then there's on the other side of it, the actual playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, um, when, you, when you listen to Wes, you hear this huge, big sound. And it's, I mean, that's something that I'll, that I'll never get. I mean, this is, there's just something fundamental about using your thumb. And I can't do that. I just can't. I can't do it. But when you when you use that, I did it. It it's got less attack, but you can get more of the body of the sound. So right. I can kind of do a sort of impression of it. But I'll I mean, just it's never um, be, mute your vocal mic. But it's, it's never going to be the same as the thumb. It's, just, it's, like, I mean, it's more like a pluck. Yeah. You, you just can't get the speed. Yeah. You know? Um. So, it's. I guess I, I, I'm just trying to land somewhere between Wes and, and other players that I like, like Joe Pass. I mean, but somehow, sometimes his sound wasn't that great. Right. Other times it was fantastic. Right. Um, it, in his later years, he used to DI quite a lot, which I didn't really like. No. But when you can play, you can play, and it almost doesn't matter, you know. But I just know that I don't like the sound of um, sort of really thin strings and. Um, in. I think if I hadn't have been a rocker in my younger years, then I might have, you know, used a bit of distortion once in a while. But I kind of felt like that world was over there yeah. and this world is over here. So I've never really gone for it. Um, there was a funny clip that you put on Facebook. Um, oh, no. A couple of 
months back where you, um, for a joke, I'm not sure this was uh, for comic, comic effect. <laughs> Didn't go down very well. Put the distortion on and everybody loved it. Well, I don't, I don't know if everybody loved it. I, I, I mean, I was basically taking the mick out of Bill Frizzell. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, it was, I, it was just, I mean, I was completely out of my mind. It was right in the middle of lockdown in a blazing hot summer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I just... I just thought it'd be a laugh, but I really offended some people, and I'm really sorry about that. You know, <laughs> and Bill Frizzell is obviously a fabulous guitar player. It's just, you know, jazz is a very broad church. It's yeah. a very big umbrella. Yeah. yeah. So the organ trio. Um, yes. Been, organ trios have been have been making a bit of a revival recently, haven't they? Um, I mean, you never heard as many sort of 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, maybe. I mean... Um, Maybe you've popularised it back uh, again. Yeah, of course it was me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't think it's ever really gone away, but it's um, but certainly there was that, that there was that kind of uh, um, there was an army of organ players in the, like the, the you know the sixties, like you know, yeah. Jimmy Smith, Jack McDuff, and um, had, uh, you know, um, and all the others. <laughs> you put me on the spot now, <laughs> you know, um, like loads of them, like a whole army of them, and uh, and. It, it, it tended to be a certain way somehow, you know, that like the organ trio was, was just a certain kind of thing. It was big and it was bluesy and it was uh, raucous, you know. And then... Um, and you could get a big sound for three people. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and the communication's very immediate as well. And then, of course, you had um, suddenly uh, Larry Goldings came through with uh, Bill Stewart and Peter Bernstein and, and their school of thought was completely the other way. You know, it's just about not pulling the trigger about playing some real beautiful, you know, and quite often complex tunes, but still rooted in the blues, but with with, uh, um, with restraint. And that's, yeah. um, uh, I think they've done a massive thing for, for organ trios. And uh, I, I would say that most people probably aspire to, to get somewhere towards that kind of outlook, you know, these yeah. days, rather than just, you know, all the stops out and go for it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So... Um, and somehow, again, I'll just um, a shrinking violet on the stage, or, or, or you know, too chilled out. And, no, you know, yeah. I do get a bit excited sometimes. But I think that's part of your your kind of your kind of charm, as it charm. were. Charm. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. It's part, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think um, you get your money's worth when you go and go to the yeah, Nigel Price. Yeah, you know, it's good to have that energy and and you know that kind of driving. Yeah. It's 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 very close to my heart, you know. And, and when I sit there uh, writing or, or, or arranging, or um, I kind of put myself in this uh, uh, this zone. I kind of imagine imagine being there, and um, and I write very quickly. Um, so it's like, for instance, if I need a certain kind of thing in the set, I go, well, you know, there's obviously this gaping hole in the set. It's got to go something like this, and it will just come out immediately. Yeah. Um, so it's all it's all to do with. Um, in visualising the moment that that's going to happen and I kind of write and arrange for that group great um, you know a lot, a lot of sort of syncopation and just um, also make sure an audience knows what the hell's going on you know I mean I, I don't mean dumbing down I just mean like things like shout choruses and, and breaks and all that sort of thing you know and, it, and I think I think the band I hope the band enjoyed playing it you know yeah, yeah. It, it sort of brings you together when you when there's a lot of stuff to do as you're playing yeah. rather than play the head and then off you go on the solo and see you at the end you know yeah yeah so it's and we've got a pad of what 160 odd tunes now great so um that sort of makes me feel old actually i was going to ask you that you know because you you've done these very long tours yes over the last few years and um and it's difficult to not you know the, the thing of being a, a working band and and having that kind of rapport amongst yourselves but you don't want to get bland or bored bored with each other and just end up repeating the same sort of things all the time how do you go about tackling that is it because you're such a wide pad or well, you know i mean I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't lie to you i mean you know sometimes we, we do wear it out and sometimes my tours are too long right and you know it's uh, i remember matt home turned turned around to me in, in 2016 and he's, uh, it was like December or something, and, he, and I remember him saying, "We started this in summer, you know." And it's like, and it, it is like that. It just seems to go on forever. But, um, and it's yeah. I mean, you can wear it out a little bit. Yes. Yeah. And but I, 
it's it's just been evolution really it's it, it's so hard to uh, to find the um, find the money really to to go out and tour because I mean the the actual wages aren't really good enough to good enough they're not they're not enough I should I say you know I mean it's 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 everything that the clubs can do to actually stay open let alone you know find the money for accommodation and fuel and that sort of thing so you have to find funding yeah and uh, so I used to um, used to use jazz services which was a great thing you know you could get some money together for like a 15 day tour or something like that and then that disappeared uh, which is a real shame I mean the Arts Council I don't, I don't know what they were thinking but there's a real blow for touring musicians you know um, so I had to go straight to the source after that and it, the, the the forms are so hellish I mean you, have you ever tried them? Well we tried to do we filled one in for the for our jazz festival I think on the second or third year right. the third year I think it was It's an ordeal right? Yeah and I think you I think you told me something really funny actually it was was it something like that oh that was a that was a long five minutes <laughs> when you the first time you filled in one of those forms or something yeah, yeah. and you did it in five minutes or no, something. no 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 that was I was, I was talking to the, the the guys up at the crypt in Camberwell where we recorded our live album actually yeah and um and I I hadn't got the funding you know and, and I was speaking to these guys Russell Okamori and, and um a couple of other guys who were, who were real you know they're they're really into the whole arts council forms thing I said I can't believe I can't believe I didn't get it. I spent all day on that. <laughs> they all sort of burst into laughter. Yeah, yeah it's like, no, just, this is proper. This is yeah. even you know, just weeks really. Of, yeah, exactly. Of real hard work. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, we 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 did our best on it and thought we'd, we'd filled it in quite well. Yeah. But um, I guess they're looking for I, I, I don't know keywords and a certain something rather yeah that. I mean there's there are professionals that fill in these things and and, and you're up against them you know yeah I mean it's, there's only a, a, a finite pot of money and, and you are literally up against them so and those people are getting paid for it you know so it's it's a triumph to be able to do it as a as a musician you know mm. um but I mean back to the evolution of it I, I realize the, these forms are so hellish that if you're going to do it then you may as well just do a big one you know yeah and, the, and I think the first real big one was proper big one was 2014 and there was 40 dates and it was like it was the biggest tour that people had seen yeah. in modern history you know? <laughs> and then in 2016 came along it was 56 dates and then 2018 came along and that was another big one and then um, 2020 came along and I had organised a 60 date tour um, so uh, I can't really tell you how absolutely gutted, gutted. Yeah. I am that we, yeah. we've only been able to manage to uh, we've only been able to do eight of those so far but we are going back out on the weekend we're going to play in Bath Chapel Arts in Bath excellent which is un unbelievable I mean I, yeah and then um, uh, so you're finding new venues to play finding new venues are, are you I, finding I, new venues yeah I mean yeah. I, um, you'd, you'd be surprised there's more venues than, than you might think you know, I'd, uh, you know some people say to me what do you mean 56 days I didn't realise there were 56 jazz clubs yeah but there's yeah. hundreds of them yeah you know if, you, if, if you're prepared to look for them just as they're always disappearing you know yeah so there's um yeah there's a lot of people that are really passionate about it out there and it's uh which is why this year you know is so awful because those poor people are so you know they've yeah. done they've worked yeah. so hard yeah you know to get these places going but anyway fingers crossed it's all going to end soon cool let's do another tune yes and then um guys get your questions in um people are actually enjoying the music which is good um <laughs> it's incredible <laughs>
Cool. Um, Swanish Jazz Festival. Oh, cool. How on earth did you end up deciding to take that beast on? Well, I, I think this is. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know really. I've always just been um, a volunteer. You know, I, I can't help myself if. Um, I don't know. Should I say this? This is a bit too cheesy, really. Um, but I've always wanted to help people and things I, I can't stop myself it's like I, I've got no control over it I remember in the army um, I was in Belfast and the, uh, um, the, the I'm, I'm tattooed quite heavily right. although you wouldn't know and um, there was uh, uh, this time where the, the tattooist needed 60 quid to pay his rent and um, I said well I'll get a tattoo then <laughs> so I just picked <laughs> one off the wall and I didn't really think about it brilliant and um, it turned out to be um, a cavalry man on a horse, like coming charging in with a gun, you know. I mean, it's stupid. I, I, I won't get it out now. I won't show you my tattoos now. <laughs> but, and it, it, I don't know why. I don't know why it resounded with me at the time. I have no right. idea why. And um, I, I maybe, maybe I've grown into it or sort of something like that. But I always just, I don't know. Always wanted to be a bit of a hero or something like that. You know what I mean? I've always yeah. felt like the cavalry. Yeah. Like, I can help something, uh, or if I can help something, then I will help it, and, I, and I, I've got no control. So there's, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd played there two or three times over the years, and then uh, just went down, went down there one year, um, and um, well, no, I'd, I'd, I'd heard that it was all, it was all stopping, you know, and it was. I was thinking, well, what on earth is this all about? It's been going for forty years. I mean, what's the problem? And I could I could see how a, like an older generation would would finally think oh, maybe it's time to throw in the towel there. But I just couldn't believe there wasn't anyone around that was willing to help it. So and, and I I waited and waited, and no one else was jumping in. So I I got in touch with Fred uh, Fred Lindop and just expressed my interest. And uh, I think a couple of other a couple of others had too. But I think I put up the biggest shout for it. And um, before I knew it. I was I was kind of in, um, but it needed a bit of help uh, in the sense that there wasn't really enough money in the pot to actually run a proper event. Right. It, was, it was too it was too much of a, too much of a, a risk really. So um, I met up with the council and I'd, I'd basically told them if I could raise fifteen grand, then I would do it. And uh, so I embarked on a crowdfunding campaign and also put on a, um, a benefit gig down in. Uh, down in Swanage, which um, which Martin Taylor actually yeah uh, yeah fantastic to do yeah. With. I just yeah. couldn't believe couldn't believe I got him I, I, I amassed a great team of people um, who do we have um, oh, I'm not going to run through them just in case I forget I, I forget someone um, but it was a who's who of it, it was a bit yeah, of a who's who yeah, yeah. and uh, and I want I really wanted Pete Long to front it it was like a jazz at the Philharmonic sort of thing yeah. and Pete couldn't do it. And I was absolutely gutted. Well, no, he originally said he could, and then he couldn't. And then it turns out his gig got cancelled, and he could do it. So it just like yeah. So it was the, the, the jazz at the Philharmonic with uh, Martin Taylor on first, and it was, and we sold it out. We managed to raise. Um, yeah, I'd keep a long story very short, but we actually managed to raise the money. Um, so yeah, that was it. Um, and. Um, did you um, always know it was going to be a one-year thing? Because I think no, you, no, no, you... not at all, not at all. I mean, I, I, I was kind of in it for the long haul, really. Right. Was, um, I mean, I, I was really into it, you know. And um, although my my other half wasn't at all, <laughs> what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Um, but even if I'd wanted to get out, I couldn't because by the time you know, when I started doing the advertising, I, I spent a lot on advertising and and not just advertising, but changing infrastructure. Like there was no. You didn't have an email address or something? Uh, right? Or it, didn't have a website was, or something? Um, there was no uh, kind of online mailing list. It right. was all physical mail. That so every it, time yeah. I sent out a mail, it cost, it was costing over a thousand quid. And I thought, man, this has got to change. So I had to send out the original mail, you know, can you change to the mailing list? Yeah. Um, so there was all that, all that money with ticketing and all that. So before I knew it, I was up to my neck and there was no way I could pay that money back without running the festival. Yeah. So, I was, yeah. I was, I, I had to do it, you know. Yeah. And it turned out to be 
I just uh, I mean I can't even describe how much work it was yeah it was horrendous absolutely horrendous and I did everything I mean from hiring the toilets and arranging the skips to because this is like an outdoor mainly yes, an outdoor a, it was 60, yeah. 60 bands 10 venues yeah um, and how, how well were you received by the people or some of the people that used to run it before or the townspeople or yeah, well, you know, did you come up did you run into I did run into a few problems yeah. but I, you know um, the vast majority the overwhelming majority of people were absolutely lovely um, and that's maybe all I should say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did have a couple of run-ins and they were funny and I, you know, I wish I could write a book about it but I would incriminate far, far too many people but there were some really hilarious things that happened down there um but yeah, I, uh, I didn't always, I, I mean, it was bewildering how I didn't get as much support from certain elements of the council and, right. uh, and certain certain um, ex-committee uh, members. It was bewildering. Right. And some of it was a little bit um, a little bit nasty, actually. Uh, but I battled through with my, uh, with my boyish charm. <laughs> and, um, well, doing these sort of things, you, you find out a lot about human nature and yes. the good guys and the bad guys and absolutely. what drives certain people and what doesn't absolutely yeah. and, I, and I think um, I mean it's only it's only it's only looking back that I realise you know like um, I mean, like for a lot of people for instance school is the biggest institution that they'll ever be in and they'll, they'll always look on, look back on those days oh, you know incredible the best days of my life but of course I left school joined a bigger kind of school the army met yeah. another I just met so many people in my life that I think I do know I do know what makes human beings tick right and it's, somehow it was it was it was like it was almost like a game in a way just trying to get things to happen when you know people didn't always want them to want things to go your way or yeah um, I mean I wouldn't call it manipulation I mean that, that's that's too strong a word but I, I managed to you know um cheerfully cajole people into into um just making it happen just, just trying to whip up enthusiasm right. you know, it, it, it made me feel like i understood the human race a, a bit better right you know yeah. there's, there's there's good and bad out there but yeah. ultimately yeah you know if you put enough if you put enough effort in then you can you can make it happen and we made it happen and it's Brilliant. i mean the, the people that were there and there weren't that many people that were there, I suppose. I mean, maybe a thousand people or so. But it's not like Glastonbury or anything. Yeah. But everyone who was there will tell you that it was. It really was something that year. You know, it was incredible. We had the circus tops up there, and right. you know, it was uh, like the biggest tents they'd ever had. And you know, in, so it's uh, probably like the year of the Saunders Jazz Festival in modern times, I guess. In yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of overran a bit with my enthusiasm. And, yeah. You know, really, I'd, I should have been a bit more careful. And if, if there'd have been a committee, then... In I'd, hindsight, would you do it again? Yes, but I would have, um, I would have got a, a bigger team, I think. Because if, I mean, for instance, if I'd have had an accountant, they'd have been calling me up every five minutes saying, what the hell are you doing this for? <laughs> you know, and it's, um, yeah. and I, I made it through, excuse me, <coughs> just kind of by the skin of my teeth really yeah um, but everyone got paid um, and everyone had a great time and, brilliant uh, so it's now, definitely um, worth, worthwhile I mean I think I fundamentally changed like the infrastructure and I built up a really great uh, relationship with the theatre in the town which is something that had been a bit lacking in the past but it was it was an incredible experience to actually get immersed in the politics of the town mm. and it was I mean I could write a book about it you know, like, I mean like I mean the festival was run by the sort of left wingers and the council were right wing and it's I mean I, I can't even really begin to explain what a complicated situation yeah, was yeah and that leads us to kind of where you are now taking over the Shepparton Jazz Club yeah bloody similar thing but I uh, did it again didn't I yeah <laughs> after all that <laughs> didn't learn, didn't learn your lesson <laughs> I, should, I should have listened to Bianca again she yeah. said what are you doing don't do this and I, and I just thought wow well, you know, it's not going to be another Swanage because it's just fundamentally not as big. But there's, um, I, ran, I've, I ran into some, some uh, more problems that you you might have thought there. It's been right. a little bit of a battle, right? But we're still going, and that's all that matters. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't matter what's going on behind the scene as long as we keep the infrastructure for jazz going. Then the battle's won, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, I've I've learnt to be patient over. Uh, and the things you've learned from Swan, are you taking a, some of the some of your experience and totally things from Swanage? Into, Absolutely, yeah. there's, a, there, there's a lot I learned down there, I, I like an incredible amount, um, especially about advertising and um, 
and just just being able to judge how much support there is out there and um, never to expect too much and it's always better to be pleasantly surprised than yeah. to sort of um, stick all your eggs in a particular basket thinking oh this is going to happen because everyone everyone's going to get behind it I'm just going to check if there's any more questions on here <coughs> not so much questions I think everyone was just saying they, how much they enjoyed it let's have a look um, not really so that, I guess that brings us on to what you kind of your what you're doing at the moment in the future of live music and jazz and recording new album hopefully going back out on tour tomorrow you out tomorrow uh, no not tomorrow it's, it's going to be Sunday it, it was going to be tomorrow um, we were going to be in Oxford tomorrow but um, we just couldn't do it because um, um, although uh, yes no because they haven't got enough scotch eggs <laughs> <laughs> or pasties yeah um and then we were going to be in Leeds on Thursday and Leeds is in tier three and then we were going to be in Birmingham. So, yeah, I, I'm, I've, I've learned not to take it too hard. No. But we're, we're back out to Bath on Sunday and then hopefully Wales on um, Monday and Tuesday, which is all going to be at, like online events because they're, they've gone into some kind of lockdown. Um, Are you kind of constricted with the tour and the funding? with uh like an end date do you have to get this done by a certain yeah, time yeah I've, I've been i've been kicking that into the long grass but I, I, at right. some point i am going to have to have a little chat with them and say look this is this is going to overrun people have been postponing and but um i mean it's unprecedented time so i'm sure that they can everything has, is can't be some slack moved. yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I um i heard that they'd they'd cut people with a bit of slack on, on, on the first lockdown right. there, there were a load of uh funded projects that obviously didn't go ahead there and I, I think they more or less said, you know, just, you know. Yeah, defer it. Yeah. yeah. I hope that's what they're going to say, because <laughs> if they want it, if, uh, you know, if they want if they want me to write a cheque, I'm afraid I've um, spent it all on pasties. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, um, I managed to record an album uh, over lockdown, which is uh, it was, it was something I'd, I'd, I had plans to do for a while. Um, it, I mean, people kind of know me as a kind of wezzy guy, I suppose. And I never really intended to be, but it's, uh, you know, you end up just kind of, uh, I, I sometimes call it feeding the lions. You know, people people yeah. expect a certain thing from you, so you just give it to them. And um, maybe I've, um, and it's not because I'm dying to be popular. I just don't want to disappoint anyone, you know. So um, I just figured I'd, I'd, I'd draw a line under the Wes thing, once and for all maybe, and, and just say, I'm going to record uh, an album's worth of um Where's Montgomery inspired stuff, but it's it's uh, I'm going to do a different take on all the compositions. So it's called Where's Reimagined, and um, it's it's not really reinventing the wheel or anything, but it's just uh, playing certain um, compositions in different fields, fields and things. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, it's come out really really well. It's sounding great at the uh, River House Barn, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, since then, I mean, um, well, of course, we've got saxophone on it as well. Yeah, um, we've got Vasilis um and Tony Kofi as well. Uh, we've got percussion, and I also. Um, uh, this is on the album. This is on the yeah, recording. Yeah, and also, uh, when I was walking around the common with the dog um, in, in, in the lockdown, I was thinking, man, wouldn't strings be amazing? And I commissioned Callum Al to write some string arrangements. Great. So yeah. can't be a bit of strings. Man, I mean, yeah. it's. it's uh, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 kind of counterintuitive, but I, in a way, but I I figured a, a lot of people might have. Um, been recording solo albums over the last few months go before. the other way <laughs> exactly and, I've, yeah. and I've, I've actually put more into this huge production than yeah maybe I, I otherwise would you know because of that <coughs> so is it really, is I haven't, it, I haven't spoken this much in, in months, a long time yeah. uh, is it out yet is it is it no it's uh should be out february march on uh, ubuntu oh so, that's uh um martin Martin, Martin yeah. Hummel, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great guy. He's doing a lot for jazz. He's doing loads. I think yeah. everybody signs to him, aren't they, at the moment? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's it's a good company, and he's it, um, himself and Quentin Collins who runs the label. They've got a great outlook. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what Ubuntu means, but something like "together we're stronger." Or something yeah, like it's that. an African phrase, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm hoping that's not yeah. what I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're socially distanced, though. Um, so yeah i'm just going to wrap this up i guess um thanks very much please um subscribe to our uh youtube channel um hit the subscribe button doesn't cost you any money at all um but if you did 
want to um, donate anything for tonight uh, it is a free event but if you feel like giving us a couple of quid uh, I will PayPal me uh, forward slash Mood Indigo events and uh, you can give us some money there if you if you fancy it I'm saving it for a haircut yeah um, yeah so we've got nothing planned for the next one of these but stay tuned uh, sign up to our Mood Indigo events uh, newsletter we send one out once a month all the next year's gigs will be on there uh, including some more of these um, December the 20th we're back here with Alan Barnes for our Christmas special that will be Alan live Barnes. that will be live streamed as well so um, that that will be on our YouTube channel um, anything you want to promote uh, I, th- I think I probably said it all now yeah I? I said, no, spoken and if you want to join our Patreon uh, site we have a, a site where you can um sign up for just five pounds and um help us you know keep jazz alive really keep going so thanks for listening thanks so much to nigel great playing great chatting very informative and uh we will see you again soon thanks, cheers Harry. thanks mate